everybody. You're watching and listening to the podcast called How Do You Think? My name is Andrei Soslenko, and I'm privileged to have as a guest today, Glenn Grant, defense expert from Baltic Security Foundation. We met with Glenn five years ago during the interview for Channel 5, and it was amazing. And I thought we could repeat it when the war is here. Welcome, Glenn. Yeah, welcome. Sorry about the war. Thank you. Thank you. That is true. When we spoke last five years ago and we spoke on the war in, in, in the eastern part of Ukraine this, at, at the time, we haven't really touched, and I rewatched the interview, we haven't really touched the possibility of a larger conflict. And I was thinking, how did you wake up to the news when the full-blown invasion started? How, how was it for you? How did you feel? Well, it was no surprise. That was the first thing. And, uh, and I didn't have any... I didn't have any doubts whatsoever that that, uh, that the boys were going to fight hard and that everybody was going to fight and that all the volunteers would turn up because I just know so many people now in Ukraine. I mean, my, my Facebook is, is with friends and, and group is like 10,000 people, which is not, you know, it's not a Batusov number, but it's actually a number of which I've spoken to just about every single one of them. Um and that, that means that, that, you know, I get a good feedback. I'd, I'd had good feedback from people. And being in Ukraine since, off and on since 2014, I'd sat in enough bars with enough people to know that, you know, there was a stubbornness there that, that wasn't going to give in easily. And, I, you know, any any anybody would be foolish to think that, that what happened in 2014 and 2015 with volunteers was not going to happen again. I mean, one of my friends who's on the front line at the moment, um, uh, he 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 left because he just said that you know he couldn't work with the with the officers who were he was a sergeant couldn't work with the officers who were treating him still like a, a conscript, uh, and he was he was you know pissed off to use his words, but that as soon as the war started he would be back, and he kept all his kit and in fact improved his kit by buying more. And as soon as the war started, he was back to the same battalion uh, and ready to fight again. So I knew with people like him that it wasn't going to be easy for Russia. So what I hear is that you have you had no doubts that the full blown invasion would start, and also what what I hear is that you 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 met so many Ukrainians that and which made you feel and believe that when the war starts, we're going to defend fiercely and. Yeah, that's basically that's basically and, and how you put it. You, you remember that I wrote in Kiev Post, you know, how to defeat Putin. My my, yeah. my letter to the president in in twenty eighteen, um, February twenty eighteen, which in fact Poroshenko had about three months before, but put it in the bin, um, and which is why I went public with it. And and it was quite clear on there from me that, that the big war was going to come, and I knew then you know, 2018, that it was going to come. And it was quite obvious because the general staff in Russia were saying, you know, we're three years away from being ready. Well, ready for what? Not ready for a sports competition. You know, so, I mean, if you've got literally, you know, the chief of the general staff saying words like that, you have to take him seriously because Putin was saying it. Putin's not, not changed his views since 2014. And the country was already at war. You know, and, you know, people were trying to hide away from the war, but you can't hide away from the war. That was just a stage of the war. And, and therefore, if the say, big fight was going to come. And if it was the stage of the war, so what was the stage of the war back then? And what is the stage of the war now, in your opinion? Well, I mean, the stage of the war back then was... was um, was was trying to do <clears throat> trying to do two or three things. I mean, one of them was obviously the political, um, the, the the political aspect of of just putting the country under political pressure, which it did quite successfully. The second one was the bleeding the defence forces, um, and and fixing them in place, which they did quite successfully. Fix them in place and actually created a a mental attitude of uh, defence. It, it, you know, quite quite cleverly, they created a, a level of defense, and then people didn't practice anything else. They were just practicing for defense. And I mean, I remember talking to an, another sergeant, and I was talking about this very thing that you're going to have to do mobile attack sooner or later. And he said, "But but we don't. This is this is the war. 
So he was already fixated, and this was about 2016, he was already fixated on the, the war was a defence line in Donbass, and that was the war. But it never was in my mind. That was just a line of that, just a stage of that thing. So, so you know, that, that created bad, bad vibes in a way because it, it ruined the training and it kept the doctrine, the doctrine, the fighting doctrine, it kept the doctrine Soviet. So the doctrine has never been changed. Nobody's rewritten another doctrine. It's still the same old doctrine. Is it still now with his illusion? Yes, yes, yes. Mm. It's still now. I mean, the boys are not doing it in the front line. So, but that that's... It's you might say it's too late now in some ways because it, the doctrine should have been rewritten and practiced, rewritten, disseminated to every soldier, and then practiced and practiced and practiced. And it changes a whole raft of things. For example, that if you still retain the centralized doctrine, which we have at the moment, then you don't train artillery observers. Because why do you need them? Because all the all the work is done from, you know, some general sitting in the artillery command post. You can't fight a mobile warfare with a general sitting in a command post. You can do, you can fire HIMARS in depth and kill depth targets, but you can't follow the close support battle where you need timely second on the second timing for, for artillery to kill someone before you move. You can't do that if you have to go back to your brigade headquarters, back to someone else's headquarters, back to the gun. Time is gone. So these things, these doctrine, doctrinal things were things that were missed and time lost. Here, I hear something that I, I uh, have some contradiction with uh, with other experts that I spoke to. Um, what I hear and what I read, that probably you also see this, that... Ukrainian army actually is using a lot of mobile, small mobile units, and uh, this is a like what's the word? Um, contemporary mobile um, yeah. warfare. So then, so then it's 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 a new doctrine or it's an updated old doctrine. And if no, it actually it's, matters, it's, how do we call it? No, it doesn't matter what you call it. But it's 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 a it's a doctrine of uh, necessity. Because they don't have the equipment, the ability, the training to do anything else. So it's small team using bravery, uh, tactics, uh, and, and good Ukrainian wit to outwit, Understood. to outthink the other side. And so small teams are good at doing this. But you can't advance on Berlin doing no. that. And uh, we're going to get back to this, the advancement and... Um... Um, and being pushed back part a bit later, I want to go a bit on meta level. Um, speaking to you five years ago, um, we haven't really covered what what do um, what the Russians want, what do they really want, and and I wanted to clarify that with you whether your point of view has developed or changed or transformed from 2017 until today, and what does Putin and what does Russia want. That's a, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think I've always suspected that he wanted to destroy NATO and the West. I, I mean, I, I felt that. I felt that. And the reason I've, the, I'm going to say the reason I've known that is because when I was a defense attache back in Finland in, in 1999, I had several conversations with the, with the, then the uh, Russian defense attache, um, who I hope he doesn't get killed for this. He's probably left anyway by now because he's old like me. But but he said very clearly, he said, you know, there will be no rapprochement. There will be no meeting of the minds between Russia and the West. He said the general staff will not allow it. He said, we want to, we we in the embassy and we in the, 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 the military attaches, we want to actually to create a, a proper environment with, with the West and with, with, with NATO, and we want to move forward. But the general staff are determined that, that to, to destroy the West and that they hate you. He said it comes across in everything they write to us. And, and I got that. And then two or three years later, when I was defense attache in Latvia, I got mm -hmm. it again from the Russian defense attache, uh, you know, just saying that, you know, we're, we're, we are between... Uh, you know, a rock and a hard place in the embassy. If we don't follow that line, 
uh, we get sent back. And if we get sent back, we're living in tents and we've lost all our allowances and our money and our wives will kill us because, you know, this is the best job we've ever had sort of thing. But the general staff, and it was always back to the general staff of, of how they, they, you know, how they hated the West. And so I knew pretty much by then that we were, we were not, nothing was going to change. And of course, with Putin just carrying on as Putin was carrying on, um, I've never lost my my view of that. Now, did I think at that stage that he would come in and destroy Ukraine? I wasn't sure it was going to be Ukraine at that stage. You know, Who instead? Back to, even when even even back to when we had our discussion, I wasn't a hundred percent sure that it was going to be Ukraine, or whether it was going to be Estonia, or whether it was going to be some Georgia or somewhere else, again, more on Georgia or something. But what I did know was that whatever he did, they were going to follow what they did in Grozny. And that, that you know, that the war would, that, that the country would be, as I call it, Groznified, just trampled, destroyed and killed. And I knew that was coming. And I've written that many times and said it many times in interview. And, and people, the number of people who told me previously that, you know, I was talking nonsense and I didn't understand, etc., etc including from Great Britain and Americans. And, uh, and well, now you can see the evidence. Why do you think people didn't understand you? Actually, I was I, the one I who, who would not understand you, who would not want to believe what you say. I don't think people wanted to because they didn't want to believe that it could be that bad. And that there's, there's, you know, there's two or three things with this, one of which is that we are still looking at a completely different culture to the point where we don't really understand Russia. We haven't really looked, people haven't really looked at Russia in the last 15, 20 years and tried to understand what is it that's driving the country. It's too easy because, you know, because they're white, they look the same. When they're in bar, when you're talking to them, they, they sound the same. It's too easy to think that they are the same. But of course, the, the Russian culture is as different from the Ukrainian culture is as different from the British culture and the German culture. Each of them is is unique in its way, but we never understood the depth, the depth of, I don't know, awfulness, the depth of evil in a large part of the Russian culture. Even I don't think I really believed it. I knew that Putin wanted to trash us, but I don't think I believed that all the army would do the things that the army has done except by order, you know. Are we talking about this. existential good and good versus evil? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, I think it, it's, 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 and I mean, you know, pe people that call the, call the Russians orcs. I mean, come on, it's like that. I mean, you know, when, when you see it in the film and you see the orcs coming across on the film, it's just, it's just evil coming towards you. There's no reasoning with them. There's no, there's no discussion. There's no diplomacy possible. It's either them or you. And we are in this situation at the moment. It's either them or us. And this is important that you mention this. To me, at least, this is important. Something that our foreign friends sometimes don't want to understand or we are not really communicating well, that it's either us, Ukrainians, or them. And this is existential for yeah. us. But I guess it's also existential for Russians. And, uh, and this makes it... Um, What's a super meta in a way? So they can yeah. stop and we can stop. But so they're then... not going to. They're not going to. While Putin is there, they're not going to. And and it doesn't matter what you do. You know, you can destroy all your your ammunition depots on the front line. They'll go and get more shit, and bring it forward. And you know, even if they have to push all their prisoners to the front to die, they will do so, because they're orcs in character and orcs in thinking. The Glenn. people have no value. How does it make you feel when you're wearing when when you know in this when you're sharing this? What does it well, bring? It, for me, I mean, it, I'm going to say it worries me because a lot of a lot of it's clear that a lot of Ukrainians still haven't grasped this. I mean, the boys on the front line have no question. You ask someone in 24 Brigade that's losing people and fighting, you know, orcs day after day after day. Everybody in 24 Brigade knows. Everybody in 73 Brigade knows. They know. They know what they're up against. But when you come back from the front line, there are still people talking fluffy talk. And what would be the fluffy talk? 
the fluffy talk that that you know that the, there's some means of accommodation that there is uh, you know that 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 it's nice and easy that we are going to push them back. You know, I, 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 I jump back to it. Faith in the armed forces, you know. Yeah, we trust in the armed forces. Well, you mustn't trust in the armed forces. You must help the armed forces because the armed forces in this country, in Ukraine, is you. It's everybody. It's every single person. You cannot delegate this war to the armed forces. You can't delegate this war to Zeluzhny. He can't do it on his own. The problem we have is that every time someone says, I trust the armed forces, you're actually making the war harder. Because, because you delegate. Control, you're delegating and you cannot delegate this war because the orcs are coming to get everybody. And how are we doing now? How are we doing now, Glenn? How is Ukraine you're in doing? A, you're in, a, you're in a, a good spot at the moment today because you've got the high Mars and it, you're killing... You're killing uh, bases, you're killing commanders, but these are, I would say, these are tactical operational improvements, but they're not a strategic improvement. The strategic improvement is you've got to take ground. You've got to, cr you know, the boys are eventually are going to have to get out of those trenches facing Donetsk and go and get Donetsk. And if they are don't we... start moving forward... If you don't start moving forward, you're only going to keep going backwards. Talk to any of the foreign military around. They just say there is only one way to win a war, and that is attack. You Taking cannot ground. win a war. You've got to take ground. You cannot win a war by defense. They will. I mean, already Putin is bringing in. He's sending in defensive fortifications, concrete defensive fortifications to the south to create a defensive line. Well, good on him because you can destroy a defensive line. You know, ask. Ask everybody who's ever made one, except maybe Mannerheim. Um, yeah. but, but, but that's in Finland and that's different, different ground. But, but you know, you have to attack. You've got sooner or later, you've got to break in and you've got to get behind people and you've got to get people to, to give up. Glenn, what is the attack that you expect from Ukrainians? I would suggest uh, from my side, that's what I hear and what I read and what I assume is, is Kherson region, so it's south, that's what you mentioned. What else do you think is the subject of being, or object of being uh, attacked? Well, I mean, they, they, if you look at the, the Russian side, they clearly want to take back or take Kharkiv and Sumy and then Kiev. I don't think there's any, there's no doubt in my mind that if mm. they can hold... And the strategy this, hasn't changed? I don't think so. And I don't think that the, the withdrawal from around from from around Kiev was a uh, it was an operational victory for uh, necessarily for, for Ukraine. It was an operational change for Russia. They were the ones who pulled back and we should have killed every one of them before they got across the border. If we could have done, they were the ones who pulled back and they were the ones who redirected. And now they're moving forward somewhere else. And that is that is a, and that's there's two or three reasons for that. One is because the ground in the center is better for fighting. Um, the ground around Kiev, because of the number of houses, because of the complexity of, of roads and buildings and rivers and everything else, is actually quite a complex area, and it suits the Ukrainian infantry. It suits Ukrainian police, SOF. SSU, all the boys, the individual boys who are very brave, it suits them to fight in those sorts of areas. Get out into the open ground and you become much more of a target for artillery and it suits Russia. Yeah, that is clear. That is and clear. That's, clear. So some, that's why they're moving forward. So something that we, we, we should expect is that when you, you, Ukrainian wars, our boys will, will start to, let's say, counterattack or attack on, on the Kherson region, then it's going to be way harder for us because we are an open target for, for the Russian defense. and for the not, Russian we, not, not necessarily. I mean, if you move quickly, I mean, get, look, at, look at the Second World War battles, Second World War tank battles. I mean, when people moved quickly, then what happened was they got round behind people and they had to, they gave up. And, uh, you know, I think you're seeing a... a, a well, you should see a similarity between the Second World War tank battles and what we need to do, actually, in, in Kherson. And the Russians can't do it. Not a slightest chance. They don't have the command and control. They no longer have a lot of the officers that could do it that are trained. 
and the boys are not capable. Ukrainian soldiers can learn it, but you have to rehearse it. You're going to do mobile attack and not just move forward in little infantry packets. Understood. And talk about rehearsal. Um, a um, few thousand of Ukrainian army, army men have been trained in Britain already and will be trained, more of them will be trained. And I know that you're applauding this and I just wanted to tell you and uh, thank you for the British government and you are a British citizen yourself, so thank you for that. And I was wondering how many more can we train in, 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 in the United Kingdom and how useful is that for the actual attack, as you mentioned, or other types of doing war except defensive? Yeah, um, it, what it means, I don't. what I don't know, and I don't know because it's kept quite secret, is what training for commanders is being done and what training in, in mobile warfare is being done. I mean, I don't know. So it would be wrong of me to, to comment on that. But I, what I can say is that that needs to be done. In other words, that, you know, commanders at all levels, right the way down from the generals to the corporals, need to be trained in mobile warfare so that they are all thinking the same. Because it's no good having one level. It's no good training corporals and sergeants how to do something if you don't train the lieutenant colonels, the majors, the captains, the generals. So you've all got to have, and that means a, a common doctrine. As I said, that means someone has actually got to agree that we're going to have this doctrine, even if it's only for two brigades. But those two brigades have got to become doctrinally coherent from the corporal all the way through. Because if you're going to do what, you know, what, what, what Rommel did in northern Egypt and you're going to drive forward quickly, you've got to know what you're doing. Got and I mean, if you look at, if you look at, uh, I mean, when, 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 um, you know, when Britain actually attacked Rommel, um, El Alamein, the battle, brigades were taken out of the line and trained before they went back into the line for the attack. So they came out, they rehearsed and then went back into the line because you can't do these things without practice because of the radio communications, because of the drills, because of the the understanding of what it is you're trying to do. Do you think this is happening right now with Ukrainian boys? I have no Today? idea. No idea. No idea. Okay. No idea. You mentioned. I am you... hoping so. Hmm. I am Understood. hoping so. Glenn, you have mentioned that uh, there are similarities with the, the way how during the Second World War the tank battles were held. And one of the questions that I, I thought of asking you and wanted to develop into the history of wars, world wars, non-world wars, um, this Russian, Russian Ukrainian war, what does it remind you of? Which wars um, and how? Bits, bits of lots of, I mean, there's a lot of the, um, there's a lot of the First World War in it. In um, which way? It, well, in the trench warfare, in the defenses. Um, uh, so it, it, in many ways, it's like, it's like three completely different wars. Um, you know, the war, the war of the Northeast is one, or in fact, maybe even four. Because the the, mm. the the war around the war around um, Kharkiv is completely different to the to the war to the, to the south of Kharkiv, which is a straightforward Russian build up as many people as you can. It, 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 the war around um, the, the the war in the east, as people are calling it, but not the not the old trench warfare lines from Avdika down south, but, but north of that, then that's really like the, 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 the breakout from um, from Stalingrad or the breakout from, you know, where, where Russia actually put all the reserves in the back and then just drove forward as hard as possible and broke the, the Germans. Uh, and, you know, heavy artillery plus, because the infantry are not, whether they're not good enough or whatever, Maybe it's because it's not winter and, the, and the, uh, we're not talking about Germans without great coats and frozen feet and everything else. We're still talking about fit, relatively fit, healthy, brave um, Ukrainians who are fighting on their own soil. So in some ways you could turn the brain around and say that, you know, the, 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 uh, the Russians have got the sort of like the German mentality of what are we doing this for? What are we actually trying to do? And, and the Ukrainians have got the Russian mentality of we're going to fight to the last man and you're not you're not taking Stalingrad, Leningrad or wherever anywhere else. Mm. Um, the, 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 the trench line, the trench line, the Donbass trench line, I mean, that's just First World War. It's exactly the same. It's been like that since 2015. 
and it hasn't changed. And the boys are hanging on there because we have a well-developed trench line. Um, and I mean, I, I think they occasionally they get pushed off, but they get back um, and they haven't been broken through, which is which is remarkable. Um, and then when you go into the south around in, in Donbass, I mean, that is very, 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 you know, it's, it's a different war again, because because the, the, the apart from Mariupol and for, for a time in Kherson and and uh, and on from Kherson, you're actually looking at the Russians having had a pretty free hand. Uh, and it's difficult to think of places like that. You know, that's maybe just like the Germans at the start of the Germans in the um, start of the Blitzkrieg. I mean, everybody had to go backwards in front of them. Uh, but, but you know, it, it, each war is different. Each war has got its own, uh, has got its own uh, methods, its own thinking, mm. its own uh, underpinning way, way of working. What you have to learn is, what you have to take from them is, is what were the lessons that you learned from that way of fighting? What, you know, what's important? I mean, the big ways is training i mean if you look at the six you can actually see the israelis were trained and therefore when they lost communications which they did do it didn't make any difference to the tank commanders because they were trained and they knew what they had to do so they carried on doing it um and that's you know th th this is this is our this is our war our ukraine war and the lessons from it afterwards will be will be seriously interesting but we have to learn them as we go along as well Understood, and I wanted. Go on. I want. I wanted to double check with the Finnish war, with the uh, um, the winter oh. war. Um, I've, I'm reading about the resemblances, but I'm trying to understand them. I still can't really grasp it. Can you help me? How is how is that representing the the winter yeah, war? I think if you look at the, the Finnish winter war, well, it was just quali quality of a stubborn resistance. And and individual skills. I mean, uh, the, the you know the the. The Finns still had. I mean, the, 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 it was it was a, a. I've got to think of the right word. You know, it was a people's war on the Finnish side. You know, it was got boys from from everywhere, from the villages, fighting, remembering that you know they 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 good condition boys in those days, because you know lots of them were off the farms and therefore they were physically capable. They could ski. Um, because there, you know, there, there weren't the number of buses and everything else that that we have now. So you got guys who could ski, who could shoot from hunting, um, and they had officers who'd been to war previously. I mean, remember they'd had a civil war previous to to to, to that, and so some of those generals had been young officers during the civil war, so had combat experience. Um, so it wasn't a completely uh, idiot bunch that actually fought the Russians. But the Russians did exactly the same as they're doing now, you know, shoot and run, shoot and attack, and just attack in masses without any coherent thinking about what they were doing. Just pushing, just numbers game. If you push enough people forward, you should break through. Well, of course, Understood. what happened was they pushed enough people forward and they all died, which is a large, to a large degree, what has been happening in the East. Right now, yeah. Um, thinking of doctrines, um, I was reading a lot of von Clausewitz and uh, Little Gard, and I'm sure you, you know both of them. And yeah. from, from what I've learned um, before the full-blown invasion, that um, in the Ukrainian army, we have used the... Uh, the and also is, is, as a business management tool, you would use this uh, von Clausewitz doctrine that there is a grand strategy and a goal, which is clearly communicated, and then... There's uh, less hierarchy, but more freedom and responsibility of those who are taking charge or the lower levels. So that we used before. And now Zaluzhny is very much uh, a fan of Little Guard. And this is the strategy of indirect action. Is that correct? Do you see that? And how no, helpful I don't, that could I, be? I don't see it as much. I see it as a bit of both, actually. I mean, the, the grand strategy coming out of whoever in the general staff, you know, is, is dogged defense and pushing numbers in. Um, and that's actually quite a bit Soviet. But then the fighting, when you get to the tactical level, the fighting is is as the boys can do, because there's no control of it in most of the areas. You can't control it. One of the reasons you can't control is that the communications are not as good as they need to be for close control. And there's not, we you know, 
Ukraine hasn't moved to network centric warfare where where everything is all knowing, all seeing. In fact, I don't think anybody has. It's too expensive. Um, but but so the boys are doing what the boys can do, and they're doing it exceed, exceedingly, unbelievably well. Um, but 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 you know between the between the the grand strategy and between the tactics, you have the operational level. And you know the difference is tactics is winning where you are. Strategy is 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 deciding what you want to do. The operational level is the ability to put those troops that you want in the right place to attack and win. And it's that ability to actually to take force and place it where you want it, not where the enemy wants you to place it, but where you want to place it to actually to win. And that is quite a complex skill. It's an art, operational art. They call it operational art. And, you, you know, if you talk, Little Heart writes about it. Um, and, and, and most actual people write about it. They just don't call it that. It's only become really, I'm going to call it operational art, maybe in, in my military lifetime. So in the 70s, we started talking about it seriously and calling it operations and learning about operations as opposed to just tactics and strategy. Glenn, I want to I wanna ask you about the way how you, in this four month of, of full-blown full war, how do you see the the level of, uh, not only of intellect, but the level of art that the Ukrainian versus Russian generals and, and, and army commanders are using? And whether in this four months, have you have you seen developments of, of this level of art of management of the uh, um, of the armies from both sides, Russian and Ukrainian. Certainly, certainly on the Russian side. I mean, uh, after Kiev, <clears throat> it was quite clear that they regrouped mentally and decided that they were going to do things differently, uh, and, and, and instead of trying to play on their weakness, which was their infantry, but to play on their strength, which was artillery. And the artillery is always, as always in in the Russian Russian armed forces, has always been the most Germanic part. Of the Russian armed forces, you, the thing about it is you have to train artillery, because if you don't train artillery, people die. Your own people, and so Russia has always uh, the, the artillery arm has always been, you know, the the queen and king of the battlefield for for, for Russia, and so they they've they've spent a huge amount of time, and as you can see, huge amounts of weapons. They purchased huge amounts of weapons, and they purchased huge amounts of ammunition because their doctrine. Is just to, to, to destroy and then walk in. Um, because actually infantry work is... Groznify, as you Groznify, Groznify. To Groznify and then walk in afterwards. But infantry work is extremely complex. I mean, this idea that you can teach an infantryman in a month is, is a joke. I mean, it, it's... it's if, if, if after six months of infantry training, you're beginning to get the idea of how to be an infantryman, then you're okay because there are just so many, so many different areas of tactics that you have to learn. Ambush, night ambush, company night ambush, battalion night ambush, company patrol, small patrol, a, a, a observation post, fighting patrol. You name it. It goes on and on and on. Bridge demolitions, reserve bridge demolitions, very complex, and we failed on those down the south, and and. You can you can go through all these tactical things, withdrawal, night withdrawal, extremely difficult night withdrawal. How to do that as a, as a, as a group without losing anybody. Um, if you've got to do a daytime withdrawal, even more difficult. Uh, relief in place where one brigade takes over the ground from another brigade. That's a skill. It's a brigade skill. Brigade moves. Brigade moves, in I, the dark, brigade moves in the light. All these things you have to learn if you're if you're going to be a competent infantryman, because it's like an orchestra. And, you know, whether you have a battalion orchestra or a brigade orchestra or a company orchestra, each of them has got to be able to play its place properly. So then how does it work out that we are in a good place at the moment? Is it because we, uh, well, we are on, on our soil, we have trenches and everything, and then we are defending, not attacking. We have support yeah. at the moment. And also, are we more qualified as soldiers, as infantry, as alter, no. Art, artillery? As uh, No, okay. you, 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 I mean, I'm going to say that the, the, much more intelligent, much more intelligent. I mean, the average, the average, 
the average person that you've got on the front line um, appears to be head and shoulders better in health. I mean, just look at the pictures of the Russian soldiers. Yeah. Half of the, except for the regular battalions that have been well fed, half of those soldiers are, 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 are I mean, they're health risk. They're thin, they're alcoholic. You don't have, you do have an alcohol, an alcohol problem uh, in some units, no question about it, but it's nothing like the Russians have got. The Russians have got an alpha, an alcohol ethos, not just a problem. Um, you know, it's an ethos of drinking right across the whole system. Is You've it got, working against Russia? Of course, it's working against them heavily, heavily. So they can't trust their soldiers not to drink. I mean, if they get near a shop, any any civil. I mean, I've always said, you know, the first thing we should have done if Russia attacked was open every alcohol shop and put it by the side of the road, because they will stop and drink it if it's there. Um, Understood. And, that, that's a, and that's a problem for them. Um, the the there, there are other other things. I mean, one of them is is that if you take a centralized a centralized army, which the Russian is, that centralization is based upon one fundamental tenet, which is mistrust. You don't centralize if you trust. You don't That's need to centralize difference. if you trust. Whereas we have trust. And that's a huge difference. So when you talk to the commanding officer of so-and-so and you say you've got to do this, you're on a pretty 99% chance that he's either going to say, I can or I will, or he might say, I can't. I've got to pull back, which we've actually seen in the last couple of weeks. And that is the difference. That's a fundamental difference between people who will just go and die for the sake of dying out of stupidity because the bosses have no trust in whether the, the commander at the front is telling the truth or not, and people who you trust, that when you say, I can't do this, I need to pull back, you believe them. So to take that trust and mistrust mm -hmm. mistrust point, and that mistrust runs right the way through the, 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 the Russian forces. There's also, um, also the, 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 the power-based system. And here you've got, again, a fundamental difference. Um, that the Russian system is totally power-based. And when you're in a power-based system, you can't tell your boss anything because if you tell him, it means he's wrong. <laughs> and if he's wrong, then you're saying that he is actually, uh, he's actually shouldn't be there. He's the wrong person to be there. So your mm -hmm. boss always knows best, even when he doesn't. Now look at Putin at the moment. He knows best. He knows what the war's doing. He knows everything, but he doesn't because nobody tells him because they're frightened to tell him. Now, mm -hmm. what's the big change? The big change in Ukraine, Zeluzhny, because Zeluzhny likes people and it shows. And they all know that he likes people. And therefore, they don't feel the same demands of power on them that others would do. Therefore, they know that there's a pretty high chance they can actually say something. Trust me, talking to a lot of my friends in there, half the army doesn't but that that's normal that, that is normal there's still lots of people who see ukraine as a power-based system i mean this nonsense of you know the supreme commander well he's not a supreme commander he's supposed to be the political guidance not a military officer there's another subject we can discuss mm -hmm. um so you know you can take these two things that they take away this high power system the complete lack of trust the other thing is that the Russians don't follow a plan. The Russians follow a script. That's interesting. It's not the same. So you take a script. A script is learning Romeo and Juliet. So you learn Romeo and Juliet to go on the stage for Romeo and Juliet. You, 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 the director keeps you to Romeo and Juliet. He doesn't want you to actually to come out with the lines of Hamlet halfway through. Mm. Whereas in a plan... You don't go into a plan with Romeo and Juliet. You go into a plan with all the things you need and you use, you pull from the one that you need at the time. And there's the fundamental difference, which is why down south, why is it that they keep using the airfield at Curson? Because it's in the script. You have to go to Curson, set up your headquarters, and then the boys will go forward and attack. And you're not allowed to change because it's power-based. You can't tell your boss, this is an effing stupid idea, boss.
because then you're telling him he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, and he doesn't have to be in the place where he is. Yeah, and he doesn't have to be there anyway. So you know, the whole thing that, that the whole system works against itself. There are okay. upsides on that. There are upsides being that people do what they're told, and then they keep going like orcs. That's the upside for Russians. The withdrawals and the love to uh, the love towards people. So Zaluzhny is seen, and, and from my side and from many eyes, as, as, as the person who brought this idea of we have to save as, as, as much personnel as we can. Each each of you is, is valuable and important, and this is a mental change in a way of how I perceive army and how I perceive Ukrainian army. And then, this is point A, point B. Uh, knowing that, we are uh, facing Ukrainian withdrawals um, tactical or whatever from some positions where Russia is slowly but massively, meaning with the amount of people there, advancing. And if I'm not a prepared, um, I don't know, not a if I'm not a prepared Ukrainian who understands that this is just a piece of um, I don't know uh, military art, I do see this as oh my god, we are withdrawing. But we don't know. Sometimes we as Ukrainians, let, let's say my parents. Uh, they would accept this as something that, oh, wow, so things are really bad. We're losing people probably. But on the contrary, we're actually saving people with this. But that's my thought. And I wanted you to clarify whether these um, withdrawals are good or bad, or we don't even have to put them um, in the context of good or bad. It's just necessary. Well, I'll I, I go to your first point, which is that, you know, the idea that people have value is not a illusionary thing. I mean, he's just he's just allowed it to happen in the army. I mean, if you go back to 14 and 15, society was really talking about this. And after um, after Illavisk, you can actually see that society does not want people to be killed for, for no reason. That just yes. holding a piece of ground, uh, holding a boiler for no reason at all um, makes no sense. And it makes no operational sense. You always straighten your line if you can because that, that, that means the least amount of soldiers you need for defence. When you have a, 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 a boiler shape, this U shape, you need more soldiers because you've got to cover the sides and the front. That means that you haven't got the spare soldiers on the side to use as reserve. So you straighten the line to pull people out to use them to attack somewhere else. That is the logic. So, you know, you know, for parents, I'd say you have you have to give and take where the battle goes. You can't just stick and die forever because there's no there is no long term value in that. That 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 is that is, you know, that's the, the old First World War thinking. We've got much more modern weapons and more modern equipment nowadays. We've got much more mobility nowadays. And therefore, it's a, you know we've got more ability to break through. This is why we created the tank in the first place in the First World War because we required mobility. Horses were not sufficient; they kept getting killed. And so, you know, we went to war in the First World War with a phenomenal amount of horses. Phenomenal. I mean, they were towing guns, they were towing carts, they were towing everything. You know, as the engine was gradually building. But then the horses kept getting killed, and you needed so much hay to keep all the horses going. So the tank was a necessity. Well, nowadays we've got tanks and we've also got other armored vehicles that drive extremely quickly and we've got drones. There is no need to fight a war in that way if you don't have to. Ukraine has had to for periods. And when you have to, you have to. But you should not do it to the extent where you lose all your soldiers if you can't use them again for something else. So if you're going to have to go back in a week's time or two weeks' time, you might as well go back now and, and try and do something else tactically or operationally somewhere else to, to stop the enemy having free use of his reserves. Because this is all about reserves. It's all about reserves. This game is all about reserves. If you haven't got reserves, you're lost. And who's winning and with the reserves game? Russia at the moment, because they're putting their reserves where they want them and pushing us backwards. Hmm. Hmm. And with the conscripts being uh, summoned uh, to Russian army, let's call it hidden in a way, but st still not, not in an in open way, um, and being trained for just one month, 
that's at least what we hear from the um, intelligence mm-hmm. services of Ukraine. And you mentioned that it's not enough for the infantry and for any type of uh, uh, of the squadrons. How qualified is, is that part of Russian army that is common as reserves? It's not. I mean, it will depend upon it will depend upon native wit, fitness, and motivation, Understood. rather than actually rather than actually military skill. I mean, some of them will shoot straight. Many of them won't. Many of them won't even fire their rifle. Um, and they will die. They'll, be, they'll die. They'll just be too frightened to fire their rifle, or they'll they'll, they'll just you know run from wall to wall. Um, or if they do fire their rifle, it'll be like the, that wonderful picture before Grozny of the of the guy with it, holding his rifle above his head in the trench and just firing like this, you know, yeah, just at nothing. Understood. Consequences. Let's talk about consequences. So we are for uh, 140 days and more yeah. and counting in the war, uh, full-blown war. Um, in each month, you as an, as an analyst and as an expert, you've seen developments and, and you would project, uh, project uh, consequences for both sides and el- for other players. And I'm curious how this way of you seeing the consequences, let's call it each month or each, each new phase of war, has changed. And what are the consequences from this particular moment for Ukraine and for Russia, which are inevitable already? There's an inevitability on the Ukrainian side of running out of things. I don't care what people say about the United States and Britain and everybody else giving stuff. Even they will begin to run out of you know ammunition and everything else. Uh, uh, therefore, the consequence of it is that we have to start thinking about using every round carefully. The consequence of it is is that soldiers have got to start thinking about not just firing off, bam, 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 bam. And I looked at the last Batusa video, and and you know, you fire three rounds at someone in the general direction, it doesn't make much more difference than one. You know, you fire ten rounds, it doesn't make much more difference than three. Uh, you've got to be careful with ammunition because if you're not careful with ammunition, it runs out and it burns away, and therefore. It, the consequence is that people have got to think about how to fight the war much more carefully with the resources. The second consequence for Ukraine is that Ukraine has got to start creating its own weapons. If this war goes on for another year or two years, then if Ukraine is not creating its own weapons, it's going to run into problems. It cannot afford to think that this is all going to go nicely. You don't plan and prepare a war like that we are you know ukraine we are surviving on the goodwill of other people that and when you're saying end. that we have to think of that and we have to build it yes are you, are you we, implying we, that we are not and we are not yeah, thinking I, I or think someone I'm in impl- power is i think not. i'm implying that we're not yeah i don't i don't I, but i might be wrong i can always be wrong with these things i might be wrong there might be lots going on in the background but I'm just suspicious uh, when I, you know, when I hear things and when I talk to th- and I talk to people who live all over the country and who live in other places that I don't see, I don't hear whispers of an ammunition factory being built in Poland or in Latvia or in Lithuania. I don't hear whispers of anti-tank factory being built in Lithuania or Poland or somewhere else Understood. for Ukraine. And, you know, so those things we've got to that the, the country's got to go onto a war footing because it is at war. It's a, a, it's an existential war. It's orcs versus Ukraine. We've, as I said at the beginning, and therefore you have to treat this seriously. At the moment, we're still living on hope. We live. We get more high Mars, and that's going to kill. It doesn't. It doesn't take you any further forward. We fired all these high Mars. We've killed all these ammunition places. But it hasn't changed the front line one bit. Yeah, we haven't retaken any piece we of land. We haven't retaken yet. anything extra. You got, you know, so that's the consequence. If you're going to go forward, it might be in six months' time, eight months' time, a year's time, because Russia might hold on for that time. You don't know what they're going to do next. Hmm. And, and these are two consequences. Russia, those are two two consequences. You know, Ukraine's got to take this seriously. And it's got to start thinking hard about how it fights the battle so as not to waste the resources. 
Understood. So and you didn't it. mention consequences for Russia, which are inevitable. No, I haven't got to there yet. I mean, the consequence for Russia is, is, is of course, the big one, is the breakup of Russia. Um, if which is foreign... inevitable to you. <sighs> no, it's not inevitable at all. It's not inevitable it, 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 because, because Russia is a strange beast. It's a strange beast. And, you know, whether, you, you know, you look at you look at the you hear people talk and the loyalties are still, you know, will still support the president. And that's even from people who are who are not Russian nationalists sort of thing, because they're Russian, because Russia likes to suffer. And so there's no consequence, guaranteed consequence that it will break up. But there is a consequence from the way that they're looking at this, that they are going to keep going that no matter how much you destroy them, unless you actually take them all the way to, 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 to total defeat, that they will keep going until they're totally defeated. Thro as I said, they'll, they'll throw everything. They'll throw all their prisoners. They'll throw women if they have to. They'll throw everything because this is, for them, this is also existential in that they believe the world is fighting against the, the greatness of the Russian Empire. Mm. Will they declare the war on Ukraine? Someone said Putin was going to do that tomorrow, but I don't think he can afford to for the moment because to declare war means that it's no longer the war that he said it was in the first place. But having said that, he's you know everybody listens to him. They forget what he said last time. So if he says, you know, I have to declare war because this is not a war against Ukraine. This is now a war against NATO then everybody will say, oh, yes, of course, this is against the United States. Because, I mean, as I know from reading, that, that after the first attacks, there were genuinely soldiers who believed that they were already fighting the US and fighting NATO troops who were around Kiev. They were quite convinced. So, so you know, if they were already told this before they came, it, it's not that difficult for Putin to actually to convince people that, hey, we are fighting the West. We're fighting NATO. We're fighting. We're fighting. And and who knows what? Who knows what they're hearing from the back from Iran? What they're hearing in the back from from India? China. From China. You know. Yes, you are fighting U.S. Yes, this is against. You know, this is against Western domination of of us. And I, I think that those things are quite. You know, they're quite dangerous. Uh, they're dangerous themes that run through. The, 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 the Russian thinking. And if they do declare war, um, do you see non-military non consequences uh, which could be uh, provided by the um, allies of Ukraine? I don't really understand yet. I cannot grasp. So they, they declare a war and then what? NATO, EU, I, I, US? I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know because, I mean, I think we've still got an awful lot of leaders that are, uh, that are um, totally cowardly about the whole thing. And are trying to hide away from it. Um, I mean, if they if, if Russia declares war on NATO, I mean, it's already done that. He's done that for goodness' sakes. He's done that. So, we, and we've ignored it. Um, and if he declares war on the USA, well, nobody's going to do anything unless he actually strikes someone. Understood. You know, and striking it, someone is a question. Uh, you're in Baltic yes. states right now, are you? Yes. Yes. And Today, and. Yeah. I'm not specifying the location at the moment. And I, I was wondering, in these four months, how would these th three states, um, how were they for you? How did you feel them? How did you feel the, the polit political leadership and the actual regular people? What is the, re the reaction and action? Well, uh, the, 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 all three countries are starting to take this more seriously. I mean, perhaps the only one that's really uh, taking a really strong stand it, it, you could say militarily is is Lithuania, um, but maybe you could say that they've got the they've got the benefit of having um, Poland next door and having an American brigade just up the road, uh, which is which is actually ready to go to the the um, uh, the Sawalki Gap between Kaliningrad and, and Belarusia. So. Mm. I think you know that there is that the other two countries latvia and estonia they, they are both taking it seriously to a degree but i think that we're still living on uh we're still living on a bit of hope that it's not you know that nato is going to be enough to actually just stop putin doing something 
and, and maybe it will. Maybe it will for five, six, ten years. Are you doubtful? I'm not. Doubt, I'm not doubtful about the fact that if Ukraine is lost, even half lost, uh, that, that Putin will move to somewhere else. I'm not doubtful about that at all. He will just regroup and then carry on. Um, It'll take some time and then he will carry on. And then he'll carry on. That, that I'm absolutely 100% sure. And whoever takes over from him, you're on about a 90% chance it's going to be someone equally, equally orc-like uh, who is going to still want the, the greater Russia and carry on the Fuhrer's, uh, you know, the Fuhrer's ambitions. Glenn, out of this moment, July 14, what are the few realistic scenarios that you are considering yourself for this war? How this going to unroll? I think you've got to take that. I mean, on the Russian side, the, the one scenario that, that I keep saying could happen is that the Russian forces just collapse. That is how, how is it possible? Well, it's, it's possible because if you keep killing enough leaders, at some stage, the boys actually say, hey, this, we've got nobody in charge behind us. Um, you know, why, why are we doing this? And, they, you know, and that one of them turns around, shoots the commanding officer. Um, or, you know, remember, this happened in other wars. Shoots the commanding officer and back they go. Um, it may even be the commanding officer who says, why are we doing this? You know, there's, there's p p people and not, not every Russian is totally orc like. You know, there are some of them that have got a, a some some who will have a conscience and some who've got a brain. Um, it's hard to see many of them. But, but you know, the numbers of people that are, are saying I don't want to soldier is at the moment is small. And it's it seems to be pretty much a constant of, of like about half of half a percent or something like this. But but it could grow. It could grow if they suddenly realize that, that you know, there is no future in this. So, so that's that's the first the first opportunity, and if that happens, it'll happen very quickly, as it happened with, uh, as it happened round about you know, uh, uh, in the First World War when the uh, when the Cossacks and the Russians just <laughs> turned mm. round and went home. Um, so it's happened before; it can happen again. Um, so that's one that's one thing. The second thing is that Russia just gets driven to a standstill. Is that that, that Ukraine gets enough weapons? that every time they start to do something, they just get stomped and that they get stomped and gradually pushed, start to get pushed back in places. And even where they may be moving forward, they realize that they, you know, they're beginning to stick out because the other places are getting pushed back. Um, and that scenario, then I think that, that Putin or his successor would go for, tr try to create a defense line, the same as they did in 2015, and just take what they've got. Uh, the third option is that they just take what they've got now, tomorrow. You know that that we wake up in the morning and Putin says that's it. You know it's a, it's a ceasefire, which of course won't be a ceasefire as we know because they don't do ceasefires. But yeah. it's enough then to to for Germany and France to say, oh, brilliant! Look, we've got a ceasefire, um, and and then put pressure on 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 Zelensky to to accept the ceasefire, because that is a serious pressure and that. That is then a you know a, a, a consequential problem for, uh, for for Zelensky and for the country and for the army. Yeah. And that's number three. Uh, and that's number three. Uh, number four is that we just keep getting pushed back to some point, at which point that the, the, the country has to say stop. Uh, but but that's a this that's an unusual one. How far is that point? You know, is it is it Kiev and the river? Is it? You know, uh, is it all the way to Lviv? I don't know. Um, I don't know. But 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 it's still a possibility that Russia just keeps going forward. And and what that, the consequence of that one is that then the country has then got to take this seriously. That you can't just keep playing that, you know, let's let the army do this. That then the whole country has suddenly got to get up in arms and actually start doing things. And when you say... If we all have to get up and start doing things. What exactly do you mean? Except training, uh, training, mm. training, understanding that every soul, everybody's got to be a soldier. Um, start hardening the, the hardening the country. Start digging places, digging trench lines in places. Um, putting put you know mining the bridges, 
so that they can't go further forward. Um, just just creating a defensive barrier that 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 uh, somewhere that they're just not going to get past. In other words, what we did in Donbas, which we haven't done here yet, is actually come back thirty kilometers from the east and dig, 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 and say, right, okay, you know, get into their territorial defense battalions and get yourself ready to 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 fight. Here's the weapons. Here's the here's the system. Here's the radios. You, you know, regular battalions will come past you, behind you. Then you've got to hold and give us six weeks, eight weeks, while we actually sort ourselves out to come back again. Something like that. Understood. Um, and that's. Hi. Are there any others? So these were four and, scenarios, and fifth could be the nuclear scenario, I guess. And the fifth is the nuclear. I don't like talking about that. I'm not sure that they really, really want to do that. And if they were going to do it, why would they mess up Ukraine? Um, if they were going to do it, you know that, that there are other places to actually to do it to say that we're, we're we're serious. You know whether that's the you know the Orland Islands or whether it's Bornholm or whether it's somewhere else, um, somewhere that is is, I mean, but not both Finland and and Sweden have not joined NATO yet. Georgia hasn't joined NATO yet. So those must be, in some ways, more, more of a prime target than uh, than Ukraine. But you know, we're, de- we're dealing with nutters, and when you're dealing with people that have got you know, illogical, irrational brains to us, not to them, but to us, then they could do anything. And in the end, on the personal note, Glenn, um, what is that that you want to say to Ukrainian Ukrainian nation on July 14? Well, the first thing is take this seriously. That, that that you can't, as a Ukrainian nation, you cannot delegate this to Zeluzhny. It's cruel. It's cruel and it's wrong. It's not his job to do. It's his job to manage the army, but to, to manage the fighting for the whole country is not his job. You can't just delegate this to Zelensky and a little group of people sitting up in the OP. The whole country has got to become serious and political about this and at the moment they haven't been given the tools to do this and the military don't seem to want to give them the tools to do this Um, and the government doesn't seem to want to give them the tools to do this which makes me all think that they can handle it themselves they can't if you actually take the army as it is at the moment it's still only uh, the army and everything it's still only what seven percent of the country Army and government, seven, eight percent of the country. One million uh, army army men and women yeah. at the moment. Yeah. So one million out of forty is five, seven percent. Okay. So you still got the rest of the country, you know, and and it's you know where do we get the money from for the future? Where do we get that? How we're we going to do this from from the future? Because you're not going to get enough weapons and equipment to man the whole of the TRO. It's not going to come. There isn't that much out there. And, you know, when when Reznikov says, you know, we're going to have a million man army and we're going to go south, that's a joke because you're not going to have a million man army. You don't have enough equipment, don't have enough drones, don't have enough ammunition. We've got to get sensible about these things and start actually thinking about what it is we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Now, maybe that is going on. Maybe that's going on. But, but it's it's if it is going on, by goodness, it's a big secret and maybe the greatest well-kept secret in Ukrainian history. So, you know, but, but I hear you clearly. The country has got to be involved in this. They can't all keep going to the cafe and think that this is a good a good thing, because every time you go, you know, every time you go to a cafe, you're spending Ukrainian money in Ukraine. We need to be exporting as much as possible. We need to be doing business outside. And they've got to start thinking about who should be going out and doing business, not keeping all the men inside. We've got lots of guys who are skilled business leaders who need to go to America to, to do their next their next deal. Because that money is, you know, the tax that comes from that money is half a tank in some cases. Thank you for mentioning that. I think this is an important statement this, for yeah. many of us. Yeah. Glenn, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. 
um, very sobering, I would say, and as usually right at the point. I think we can do it in in a few months, seeing the dynamics of it. Thank you so much, everybody. You've uh, watched and listened to Glenn Grant, defense expert, defense expert from Baltic Security Foundation. Glenn, I'm privileged. Thank you so much again. No, oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. And you know, glory to Ukraine and to the boys. Glory to Ukraine. Yes. Thank you.